So, it's more or less become my urban mantra to say that it's okay to think big just as long as you remember that people are small. Our, gritty, our cities are growing and growing, and every, city, every single day, city plans are being drafted up. City plans which has their main focus on buildings, vehicles, and money. I'm going to share three of my passions today. I'm going to talk about sustainability. I'm going to talk about temporary use of space. And I'm going to talk about education through involvement. And I'm also going to talk about why we should consider of designing our cities for people. To me, this is the worst case scenario. I think that cars and architects with big egos are the worst enemy of the city. And don't take me wrong, it, it's not like I hate cars. I just don't think that they should be in control of how we plan our cities. I realized through playing with Legos with my own son, quite naive probably, uh, and colorful, creating these Lego cities where it was all about people priority. Because without the little Lego people, it would be all display and no play. So the people here was extremely important. Then suddenly things changed. I became an architect student, and suddenly I wanted to build single sensation architecture. And I wanted to create monuments and a lot of form over function. And the architect's ego was very much in focus, my ego. And it became a quite normal remark on the study tours that will ask the fellow students, could you please move out of my picture frame because I just want the building not to be disturbed by any other life form, please. I graduated, got a job, started living the dream, building lots of buildings, a lot more looking at the turnover and the floor ratio, not focusing so much about livability. Then I have a wake-up call when I was 31. And I mean, looking back, I'm quite happy that it happened at that point and not I see it better late than never. Um, I did a competition together with a quite famous Dutch company called MVRDV. And uh, what we created out at Ørsted was um, more or less single sensation architecture icons. And what I probably would call just uh, big mushrooms on a greenfield today, just popping up one by one. The wake-up call came when one of the jury members asked me, so do you think this is a city for people? And my immediate response, of course, was, hmm, well, good point. I've forgotten all about my small people, you know, people in the game, the most important part of it. I mean, my ego had totally clouded me. So here I was standing at a crossroad you know, finding out what I've been doing so far wasn't making sense anymore. I needed to get down to the right height, down to the right eye height, not plan from a helicopter point of view anymore. Maybe instead of making masterpieces, I should focus more on making pieces that fit together. I realized that now I was done making buildings, and now I wanted to make spaces for people instead. So then I started with this guy, working with this guy, Jan Gill, a guy that knows a lot about people and cities. And for the first time in my life, I realized that now my main focus was not the buildings anymore, but the spaces in between. I learned a lot about how to design cities for people. You know, his approach to and his mindset about city planning, looking at life first, then at space, and then at buildings. Also, how important human scale and the understanding of people and their needs are. And also how density, diversity, proximity, and human scale equals a greater probability of life in our cities. I actually have a funny story about this because Jan and I teaming up, trooping up for a meeting in Sydney, and uh, after the meeting, sitting on the bench overlooking the opera house, smoking a cigar, like the master and his apprentice, and Yan leans over and he says, Raz, today you talked about density, diversity, la la la, equals more life. That's not completely true. You can't promise the client life. You can promise him a greater probability of life. You know, it's just like hosting a party. You can make the right setting, you can provide the good drinks and the right dip for the snacks, but you can't force people to stay. So for the next couple of years there, 
my main focus was to create a greater probability of life. I mean, don't misunderstand me again, I'm still doing that, but I felt there was more to it. But suddenly out of the blue, we got hit by the global economy crisis, and uh, as I see it, it was actually a good thing. I mean, it was of course a sad thing, there was a lot of people losing their jobs, but the focus was that suddenly, by having this crisis, all these mushrooms on the greenfield got put on hold, and suddenly our focus changed. And at the same time, our cities transformed uh, and its urban grid, and a lot of new industrial old sites were given free um, and it be being available. And this, of course, led to a phenomenon called temporary use of space. And it's the non-permanent that has a time restriction, and it's less regulated, and therefore much more open for testing out new ideas in the urban context. What it does is that it makes people participate directly as a part of the process. So again, putting people in the center of the game, just like the Legos, and allowing them to be co-creators of their city. We can use it to help kickstart life in an area, you know, making it a place by inviting people in, remember life first. But it can also give us the opportunity to test out ideas before making their solutions. In this case, the story about Nørrebroke in my hometown, Copenhagen, where the municipality felt that the ratio between cars and bikes were a little outdated. So they actually tested by creating double bike lanes. There were several things they were testing out, but this was one of the main things. I mean, all the shop owners, of course, were screaming, this is gonna be killing us, you know, it's our sudden death. But they learned quite quickly, a couple of months later, that actually, they gained a lot more because people on bikes has so much easier for them to jump off and make a stop and shop at the local butcher than for the person in the car, you know, driving around trying to find a parking spot. And one thing that we also have a tendency to forgetting is that all other industries are actually testing their products before they're putting it on the market. You know, car manufacturers are testing their cars on dummies, not on us, luckily. I mean, pharmaceutical companies are testing pills on rapids, monkeys, and so forth, not on us, luckily. All scientific research is pretty much based on data, meaning testing. But one thing that we don't test, something that we send our kids out in every single day, something that we use and spend a lot of time in, is urban design and our public realm. It's something that we probably also have to live with for a lot longer. So all of these temporary use projects made me think, maybe we have too many rules. Maybe we, in developing our cities, we need to slow down. More invitations, less rules, more process. It also made me realize that up until now, it's been much about the physical invitation. You know, what make people come, what make people stay? And working with Gill Architects, of course, it was very much about the physical invitation and the view of man as a biological being. But temporary use made me realize that the social invitation and the view of man as a social and cultural human being was equally important. So I got wiser, and I felt that there was more to it. So I stopped working with Gill, and I started up on my own working more with the social invitation, looking deeper into citizen involvement, co-ownership, and bottom-up community planning. I saw how citizen involvement could make a difference in success or failure. Not as we knew it before, where it came quite late in the process, but by introducing it quite early in the process, why not have all the ideas? It's a lot easier to steer a boat if you have everybody on board and you're rowing in the same direction. We have, up until now, designed cities for people, yes. But it should be more a co-creation between people and planners to design our future cities. So now I was done making buildings and also making places. And instead, I wanted to not make, but to facilitate people making their cities. I started teaching urban design part-time, so my list of keywords to the students quickly became 
put people in the center of the game. Try to provide the best physical framework for life. Don't be afraid to use temporary use as an urban planning tool. Remember the social invitation, not just the physical. Make more invitations, less rules, and more process, and communicate your message clearly. So suddenly I had a lot of new tools in my backpack to design livable cities with, and I keep adding to it. And at this point, I've been talking about sustainability and what it meant for cities for quite some, some years telling the story over and over and over again that a city is full of sustainable buildings is not necessarily a sustainable city. Research actually shows that it has a 10 times larger effect if we build around transit hubs than trying to make our buildings sustainable. So in this case, proximity and closeness became a key, right? Location. But sustainability in the future, as I see it, deals a lot more how we see the world. Are we giving out pills to cure diseases? Are we preventing diseases by changing our setting? It matters how we design our cities. You know, poor conditions for walking, poor conditions for biking equals health and obesity problems. If we keep up building more road, if we keep building up more road, we keep building up more traffic. The city of Copenhagen in this case also been looking in a different direction and uh, creating these what they call supercycle highways. It's making it easier to commute to and from work with a healthier option and a quicker option also. So looking at infrastructure in a smart way in the future might be much more profitable concerning the environment and the global warming. And in my book, human data is the key for making this happen. It starts with education and involvement of the user. We know it quite well from citizen involvement processes that I talked about before. We need to focus more on educating people to make the good choices, to ask the good questions, and to expect more. But looking at the Legos again, you know, some of the user groups are often forgotten. The, tax player, the taxpayer is always in play, and the elderly people generally also find a way to join forces and get a spot at the table. And the university student and the rebel mainly also find their way in there. But what about the future youth? Here, I'm not talking about the kid with the Legos. I'm talking about the middle and high school kids. What about them? At the moment, I'm working on a project linking urban design as a part of the real world into the eighth grade classroom. Funny enough, this is a class where everybody's right, because we all use the city differently, and all voices are heard. Suddenly, they're giving tools to understand, not just for inspiration to involvement or to take responsibility and co-ownership to their community, but to be better users in the future. It's a more practical, hands-on kind of way of learning, you know, connecting urban design and architecture with mathematics and social studies and so forth. And what's so great about it is that it brings it directly back to the dinner table. You know, it's forcing mom and dad to take a stand too. And these are often the people that are too busy joining up for the workshops when we talk urban planning. So here I am today, a lot wiser than before, hopefully with still some of my childhood naive intact, approach intact, playing with people as the most important part of the game. Remember, without them, it's all display. So designing cities for people is not just about sustainable buildings. Designing cities for people is not just about livable space and the physical invitation. Designing cities for people is, for, is all about the people, by the people, and for the people.